Well, thank you, Courtney, for those very genuine and honest words. It is an, it is an emotional experience for everybody that gets to go, and it's a, it's a blessing. We are blessed uh, just as much as the people of Honduras are on those special trips. And so if you ever feel like the, the Spirit's calling you to go, but you say, oh, I've got too much going on, we all got too much going on, right? So we have to make that effort and take that first step and it's truly, truly a blessing. So thank you, Courtney, and thank you to the mission team from the video and the pictures and all that we saw. It seems like it was a successful trip. And a big thanks to everybody. Big thanks to Ellen, who heads all this up and what she does, too. So thank you all. Uh, just a few more things that are going on in the life of the ministry here at St. Matthew's. I want to lift up. I'm not going to be able to touch on all of the stuff that we have on our announcement sheets. So I encourage you to take those home with you uh, and to look over that to see what we have going on. But I do want to lift up that this upcoming Wednesday, believe it or not, is Ash Wednesday. Lent is here. And so uh, this Wednesday, I invite all of you that are able to join us for our church meal from 5 to 6 p.m. The menu is on the back of the announcement sheet. Uh, please call the church office or go online to sign up if you can. And then join us for a 6 p.m. worship service in the sanctuary for our Ash Wednesday service. Also on Wednesday, if you're not able to be here for the service but would like to receive ashes, we will have a clergy person here Wednesday uh, from 9 to 5. Either Andy, Beth, or myself will be here and we can uh, give you the ashes on Ash Wednesday if you're not able to be here for the service on March the 2nd. And then also, I uh, already lifted up the Wednesday night live meal. That's on the back there. And of course, we hope you join in again with us. If you're here visiting or if you're here for the first time in a while, please join us back next week as we continue to worship through Lent as we get ready for Easter Sunday. So now at this time, I would uh, draw your attention to our scripture passage. We are going to be uh, reading from and studying today from a very interesting book of the Bible, the last book of the Bible, Revelation. So we'll be in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. So I invite you to follow along on the screens or your own personal Bible app as the word is read. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first sayings have passed away. And then the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But as those for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, the murderers, the fornicators, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all the liars, their place will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, some of the most interesting ideas and revelations in our lifetime have come to us in very unique ways. Uh, for example, the theory of the speed of light, okay? Do we know who, who pinned that theory? Smart guy. Albert Einstein, do we know how he got that theory of the speed of light? Probably not. It came to him in a dream, in a dream. As a young man, he dreamed that he was sledding down a steep mountainside going so fast that eventually he approached the speed of light. Faster than Chevy Chase and Christmas Vacation, down the hill he went. And then at that moment, the stars and his dreams changed their appearance in relation to him. And he awoke, meditated on this idea, and soon formulated what would be one of the most famous scientific theories of mankind. Came to him in a dream. Another example of how people have gotten revelation in unique ways, Thomas Edison, inventor of many things more than just the light bulb, okay? 
in the way he got through some of his challenges and saw these new ideas, he had a system in place. Not many people knew about it until after his death. But if he was coming across a challenge and needed a new revelation on how to solve it, he would go to his chair, he would recline back a little bit, and he'd hold two steel balls in his hands, both of them with metal saucers underneath, and lean back and would begin to drift and fall asleep. And as soon as he got to that in-between state of wakefulness and sleepiness, his hands and your muscles would begin to relax, and then he would release the balls that would hit the metal plates and make a sound and wake them up. And then he had a notepad right beside him, and he wrote down anything that was on his mind. And a lot of times, he worked through his challenges that way. He got his revelations learning how to take advantage of that lucid state where you have all these crazy ideas and we forget because we fall asleep and we wake up and we may never remember them. But he found a way to remember those crazy ideas and some of them never work, but some of them will lead to some really interesting inventions. So those are just some ways we get some ideas and unique ways that have come to some people. But also revelations can also show us some things that are to come if, if something doesn't change. One of the most famous fictitious story out there is the Christmas Carol, right? Where Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by three ghosts. And the ghosts show him things that have happened in the past and things that are happening now. And then things to come, okay? Things to come that might be true if things don't change. Well, I listen to sometimes a podcast where there's two preachers on there, Rob McCoy, Eric Fissler, really smart guys, and they used this example, The Christmas Carol, and related it to the book of Revelations. Revelations. And so today, we're going to look at that last book of the Bible, which one of my favorite sources to go to, if you are ever doing a Bible study, a personal Bible study, go to this site. It's called The Bible Project, okay? They do wonderful videos, study guides of every book of the Bible, every topic, and even preachers sometimes will go to it to see if they can learn something in a new way because they present it in a really interesting way with graphics and helps it make sense. So when you're studying Revelations, this is a good source to go to for them to break it down for you. But this is what they said. Revelations is an apocalyptic letter that uses symbol and visions to reveal God's perspective on history in the light of its final outcome. So if you ever need a definition of what the book's about, that is it. You see, Revelation is the bookend of the Bible and it's also going to conclude our series that you see here of what we've been doing since Epiphany, Long Story Short. Long Story Short. You know, we, we started out in the Old Testament went through the first five books, which is the law, all right, and looked at God's covenant with his people and how those covenants still apply to us today through Jesus Christ. Then we looked at the histories in the wisdom books to see how God was with his people every step of the way, even in the failures. Then we got to the prophets of the Old Testament, the major and minor prophets, and the way that they called out God's people, called out the things they were doing right called out the things they were doing wrong and what may happen because of their sinful actions. Then we transition to the New Testament and we get to the gospel. The good news, right? Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. A little bit different than what everybody thought the Messiah would be. But what he ultimately would do would pay our price on the cross which will allow us to have that relationship with God for all eternity if we believe. And so you get to the good news. And then we get to the letters. Paul's letters, letters from other authors to the churches, expanding upon the good news and what the sacrifice of Christ means for us. That it is the truly a message for everybody, just not the Jewish people, but the whole entire world. The gates are open for all who want to believe and follow Christ. And then we get to Revelations. We get to Revelations. Now I'm trying to my best to give you the big picture of this book. We can spend months in in-depth Bible studies looking at each of the symbols and what they mean for the people of that time, what they can mean for us. And it's really exciting. If you're a Bible geek and you can really, Revelations is your book to get into it. A lot of preachers want to stay away from it too because it is a tricky book to preach on. 
and to teach on as well. Because there's so many things we can misunderstand. But what we're going to do today is we're going to get the overview of Revelations, but then we're going to get to our passage that I just read. And we're going to unpack that passage and what it means for us as Christians today. What it means for us. And so the book of Revelation of Jesus, which is actually the full title of this, was written by what many people claim to be the disciple of John, the beloved disciple. He was exiled on Patmos, an island for preaching the faith. And while he was there, he began to get visions. We don't necessarily know if he was asleep and got him in a dream, if he was awake, but he was very much involved in these visions. He would see things, he would hear things. And all this was with his, this angel that came to, pro, to provide these visions. So it's a little bit of a prophecy. It's a little bit of a prophecy. As I said, it goes back to the definition. It is a letter that uses symbolic visions to reveal God's perspective on history in light of its final outcome. And so when you get into this letter here, it starts out with John addressing the seven churches. Seven churches of Asia Minor. Okay? Seven is a key number in the book of Revelations. Seven means complete. It means whole. Seven days, when you had the Sabbath day in there, the earth was completed. Seven is perfect. So that is the key thing with the number seven in this, in this letter. It shows completeness. And so he writes a letter to these seven churches addressing some of the issues that are going on. And then he begins to tell them in detail the visions he begins to see. And so he starts out and he's in the throne room. You see God. You see God on the throne. But the interesting thing that gets introduced in this letter is that we begin to see this lamb. See, you would think the Messiah would be something like a warrior type. That's what people read into it when they read the Old Testament. But what you see here in Revelation introduces the idea of the Messiah being a sacrificed lamb, had a lamb with blood on it. And we all know who that is. That's Jesus Christ there at the throne of God. And so that is a key piece as you go through Revelation is to know the Lamb is Jesus Christ. And then when you go in further into Revelation, it starts going into these things of seven seals on a scroll, seven trumpets, seven bowls. These are the set of three seven divine judgments. They're repeats of each other just told in a different perspective. And that's when you get to all the interesting symbols, interesting signs that you hear many people debate on what they mean. How are they to be applied in today's time? What were they for in the time that it's written? But when you read through each of these seven judgments, divine judgments, the lamb comes into play to save the people. In each of these sets of seven, the lamb comes into play, Jesus Christ. So it's kind of like if you want to use the Christmas carol analogy, when you go through some of these, as they unopen un these, open these seals or blow the trumpets or spill the bowls, it looks pretty dark and ominous as you go through these for the people of God. But somewhere along the way, the lamb comes. And there's a pivot and turning point where God's kingdom then comes on earth. And the message begins to change. He's reinforcing this message of how important the lamb is for all of us. That we cannot save ourselves. We need the Messiah. And then as it continues through these three sets of seven divine judgments, you begin to see the theme of fall of Babylon. The fall of Babylon. Now, we all know in this time period, Rome was the most powerful empire of the, of the day. But when they say the fall of Babylon, the audience, the receivers of the letters know what they mean. They're making to the connection of the Old Testament exile and how they were suppressed in that time period and how now with Rome, new Christians, they're being martyred. They're being sought out. They're being persecuted. It is a tough time. And so when they make references to the fall of Babylon, the readers and the audience know they're speaking about Rome and their current situation. Then it continues, the final battle of Jesus. And this is where we get to the final battle where Jesus comes on the white horse. The martyrs are raised up. You have this thousand year period of waiting. 
This is the time period here where you get a lot of interesting discussion. Is this a literal thousand years or is this a time period that we're not quite aware of? As we become more aware of the concept of time, concept of time is a man-made thing. God said he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's above all time. So sometimes when we see these numbers, they may be literal or they may not be. It may be just meaning a period of time that must pass before Christ comes back and finishes the job. Because after that, the continuing story goes that evil will be banished after that thousand period of time. Demonic spiritual forces will be thrown in the lake of fire. Those that worship that and follow that will be thrown in the lake of fire. It will be an eternal quarantine from God and his people and the job will be finished. And so that's what you get to when you look through Revelations. There's so much that goes on to that. But this is something we also need to take, take note of. Every generation of the church is going to face persecution. Every generation of the church is going to face persecution. They were highlighting that when they brought up Babylon to bring back the memory of these people like, oh yeah, we've had exile time period. And they were now going through the time period of persecution of Rome. And if you continue throughout history, there have been moments where Christians have been persecuted, sought after. That's no different than today. There's persecution of Christians that are going on today. Now, in our country, we do have the ability to drive up to church on Sunday morning with very little hassle and worship in any way we want to. And that is a blessing for us to have that option. But not all of our brothers and sisters in Christ on this planet have that option. Some of them are meeting in homes on Sunday mornings, hoping to not be noticed by their government or by whatever community group is out there that's persecuting Christians. There are people who are being monitored all the time and watched to see if they congregate and people are trying to figure out if they're talking about Christian church or not. Persecution in Christians in today's world is a very real thing. We may necessarily don't have to experience that our life is on the line when we go to worship, but we do have other brothers and sisters in Christ that do. And situations can change. Situations can change for all of us. And so this letter is to tell us that every generation is going to face those challenges. But to have hope, to have hope because the sacrifice of the lamb. That is the key piece here in this story is the sacrifice of the lamb. And guess what? We get to see the ending. Jesus Christ has paved the way on the cross and because of what he has done, this is what will happen. Verse 21, John says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new heaven and the new earth, the world that we are in gets renewed, gets replaced with something even more beautiful than what we have now. We have the promise of a new heaven and a new earth prepared because of what Jesus Christ did for us. And see on verse 3 it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be with his people and God will be with them. The throne of God comes from heaven down to earth and we all get to live together as a community of faithful followers. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. No more tears, no more death, no more suffering. The pains that we experience today in this world will be no more. The true message of hope. The true message of hope. And that is something we are to celebrate. That is why this book, this letter that was written, is appropriately placed at the end of Scripture. It serves as a reminder that we're going to have tough times. We are going to have challenges and tempta temptations. That is nothing new. Every generation of the church faces that in some form or the other. 
But we have the promise of what Jesus Christ did on the cross that we will have a new earth, a new heaven, and God will be with his people. It will be a new garden. And I think it's really cool that the story of Scripture starts with a garden and a creation and ends with a new creation and a new garden. The story of Scripture comes a complete circle. And things will be made right. Evil will be quarantined away from God and his people forever. And that is something truly to celebrate. And so the whole idea of this series, long story short, hopefully the big picture is to know that you are truly loved. That if, if God didn't love you, he would not have sent Jesus Christ. He would not have made these covenants with these people. He would have left us and exiled us from the garden and would have been done with us from there on out. But he was not. Now, he may not be happy with all the decisions we make, but he still loves us. And he will promise us a new heaven and a new earth no matter how tough it is for us in this life. So we need to hold on to that message of hope. When you're feeling down, when you're feeling that the church is being persecuted where you feel like you're having struggles in your own personal walk in life, read chapter 21, verses 1 through 8 of Revelation and see the message of hope and see the promise that has been afforded to us the blood of Jesus Christ. And may we celebrate that and share that. Let us pray.